Uh, so yeah, this is chaos. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we, I'm, I'm going to kind of go through little parts of chaos in a sort of non-rigorous way. I'm going to go through a lot of things tonight. Uh, I took a class on this stuff last semester at Northeastern, and I'm going to go through probably 75% of that class tonight. So there's a lot of information that I'm doing. I'm not going to be doing it very rigorously. That's why. Um, but because there is so much information, I'm going to present it in a specific way. And so that's why I'm going to talk to you about cacapos. Cacapos are things that look like that, and they're adorable. For some definitions of adorable. They are these birds that live in New Zealand, and they have a lot of cool characteristics. Uh, one of them is that they're native to New Zealand. Uh, so basically, these cacapos used to be, uh, they have a common ancestor with a bird species called the kia. And basically the kia, some of them decided to fly over to New Zealand one day, take vacation, and then they <coughs> had natural predators, they bred a lot, they got fat, and eventually lost the ability to fly because they didn't really need it because they didn't have predators anymore. So they never really flew back from New Zealand, and now they got stuck there. They eventually became the third most common bird uh, in New Zealand, which if you've ever been to New Zealand, is a lot of birds. And now there's, and about a thousand years ago, there were 100,000 to 300,000 of these living. Except now, there are not that many. There are critically endangered species in New Zealand, and there are currently 126 kakapo currently alive. So, the question you should be asking yourself is, the fuck happened? Right? <laughs> so, uh, there's, there's a lot of explanations for this. One of them is Australians. <laughs> but basically, it's, it's not so much Australians as people from Western Polynesia. Uh, the Maori decided to come over to New Zealand a while ago and populate the island. Unfortunately, they started worshipping the Kakapo a lot and started killing them off. Uh, and they also brought with them rats. And rats are natural predators to the kakapo, and so the kakapo, being flightless birds, couldn't really escape from them, and started dying as well. These reasons aren't really mathematically interesting, though. Uh, the, the main reason that the kakapo uh, weren't able to recover from these things, these, uh, the Maori killing them, from the rats killing them, is that their birth rate, after moving to New Zealand, became extraordinarily low. And there's good reason for this, and it's because their mating call changed since they came. So, <laughs> ignore that for the time being. <laughs> this is the kakapo of the kia, the common ancestor from this. It's the only video I can find, I'm sorry. But it's... I'll just let it be. Do we have sound? Oh. That might be necessary. So, the Kia goes pretty fucking crazy when it wants to mate with something. It has this really loud, kind of high-pitched call, and it goes on and on and on and on, and it's very obvious where this Kia is when it wants to mate. Right? That is probably a fair thing. This is what Ari does when she wants to mate. Wow, thanks, dude. The mating call of the Kakapo, however, changed. Um, I'm going to play you a little clip of it, um, which is right here. What you're going to hear in this clip is uh, a, a more high-pitched bird thing that's not a cacapo. And underneath, uh, if you listen very carefully, you'll hear this very low-pitched booming sound. And that is the mating call of the cacapo. specialize in, in the birds, they'll, they'll tell you that the, the, what the sound sounds like is like what's coming out of a subwoofer uh, when, when you have a sound system. And if anyone here has a sound system with a subwoofer, you know, all the other speakers you have to place right by you because they're, they're directional sounds. You, you, definitely, you need, you know, the left speaker here, the right speaker here to get the right audio experience. The subwoofer, you stick wherever the fuck you want, right? And the reason you stick the fuck subwoofer wherever the fuck you want 
is because when you hear sound from the subwoofer, you can't tell where it's coming from. So, the mating call of the Kakapo is incredibly quiet, incredibly low, and you can't tell where it's coming from. Which, which I have illustrated as such. <laughs> <laughs> this is how the Kakapo have evolved. Um, since they came to the island, they had you know this, this mating call which gave them a very high birth rate. And then evolutionarily, somehow, down the line, they evolved this mating call which gave them a much, much lower birth rate. Which means that natural selection, which selects for the population of Kakapo who are able to, you know, basically populate the most, you know, take over the most of the island. Uh, um, it means that they have naturally selected themselves for a low birth rate, which is weird. Mathematically, that's like a thing that's hard to wrap your mind around. There's, there's different competing sections of Kakapo when, you know, one section changes their, their mating call by, by a, a small amount, they don't intermate anymore, and then they start competing with each other. And whoever is able to breed the best obviously wins over. But then we have this, this mating call, which sucks. And that is what has won over. So mathematically, that's a tough thing to think about. And so we're going to talk a little bit about population dynamics to figure out oh, what's going on here. So the way we're going to do this is by looking at a dynamical system. And what a dynamical system is, is where you say, I am in this state, I have this population, right? Uh, when I have 100 birds, what, what is my rate of change going to be? Or what is my population going to be next year? Things like this. These are questions that are asked in physics all the time. Uh, it, a dynamical system is applicable to absolutely everything you can think of, because this is how the laws of our universe work. But it's especially easy in birth rates, so we're dealing with birth rates. When you have this population, you're going to have so-and-so population next year. Uh, we're going to look at it first uh, on a continuous time scale. Uh, for this, I'm going to use whiteboard. Because I was too late to put stuff in the slideshow. Um, when you have a continuous time scale, you've probably done problems like this in linearity. You have, uh, you want to graph something like what my current population is, say P, um, and what my derivative of the population is, how fast it's going to grow when I'm at population this. And we'll call this f prime of p. Is everyone good with that? So uh, when I have a low population, my population is going to grow very much, right? And when, I, when my population gets higher, it's going to grow more. This is because there's more capital to breed. Uh, but at a certain point, there's a carrying capacity, right? There's, there's a certain point where the resources aren't enough for the capital to reproduce. And so you end up with a function that looks something like this. Um, we're gonna what? Is there a question? Why does it go down? It goes down because uh, eventually you run out of resources on the island, and when there's a lot of capital, they're going to not make as many more uh, the, the next year. Not as many are going to survive to the next year. Okay. And so what eventually happens is uh, when I this is zero, right? So when I'm here that means my population isn't changing. The derivative of my population won't grow at all. And this is because I've reached as many cacto as can, as can fit on the magnitude, right? Uh, here, I, I'm also at zero. This means that when I have popul positive population growth, I'm going to go here, right? And when I have negative population growth, I'm going to move this way. And that makes this a stable node. Well, I'm sorry, guys. Actually, yeah, I, it's I, I have a question. Is yeah. it a damped oscillation or an under damped? Uh, well, uh, that depends. With this current linear model that we're showing up here with continuous time, uh, it should it should go straight to the point. There shouldn't be oscillation around uh, because we've, we've decided there's a continuous time scale. Uh, Stay with me. I'll, I'll eventually show why that's wrong. Uh, so yeah, what's, what happens when you model this linearly, when, when you have continuous time, is that you end up, regardless of what your, I should probably ask first, what happens when the birth rate goes up, when they have a better mating call? What will this function look like? Will it be steeper, less steep? Steeper. Steeper, yay. So it's definitely steeper at the beginning, right? 
but does it still have this this maximum it's carrying sharper. capacity or something? Yeah, it should be a sharper curve. It should, it should go up and then come back down. Somewhere around this point, maybe a little bit higher than this point, uh, but in general, the, the, the function of that should should converge around there. Is everyone okay with that? So basically, regardless of how high my birth rate is, I'm still going to converge to pretty much the same population if we're considering getting out of resources, right? So it shouldn't matter. The, the, the higher my birth rate is, the only thing that it's going to do is when my, my population uh, fluctuates to either side, it's going to return to this a lot faster. Um, and that's, that's just because the derivative increases more quickly. So when, when I come back, it's like a spring constant almost. You know, I, I get shoved back, but, but I want to go back there. I get shoved this way, I want to go back there. So when I have a higher population, I'm less vulnerable to changes in population, abrupt things like the Maori coming and bringing their rats. Um, when I have a lower population, uh, lower birth rate, the population doesn't decrease but uh, I become less stable there. So it would make sense to have uh, a, the higher the birth rate, the more the population will survive. Right? According to this model, that's what comes up. Is everyone okay with that? Okay, I didn't, I didn't explain that one as well as I could have, because basically I'm going to show why that model sucks. Instead of, instead of, uh, going on a continuous time scale, what if we say, hey, Kakapo have generations, right? If, if, I, if I have this many number of birds, I'm not really going to go smoothly from one generation to the next. I'm going to kind of go on discrete times. And so instead of graphing your population versus your derivative of things, why don't we say population at time t and population at time t plus 1. Um, and we can, we can also call this f of p. We apply some function onto p. Is everyone okay with this? Does everyone believe that it would be a similar curve for what the population would be? Uh, because at a certain population, you know, you're going to start uh, reaching this carrying capacity and start going down again. Are we good? Is it the changing population? Because I feel like it's not the changing population. Wait, this is, this so, is actually important. So you're saying if you have the carrying capacity population generation, next generation you will have no one. That is exactly what I'm saying. And that's why this is slightly different from the previous model. Basically what it is, is uh, the previous model plus this uh, previous, plus your current population. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's because we're, we're replacing the change in population uh, the smooth derivative of population with a change in population and then adding it to the current population. Uh, so before you would have your fixed point over here, here you have a point where everyone dies over here. So it's definitely a different space that we're working with, but ultimately, uh, actually I wanted to say it has similar properties, but it doesn't, and I'm going to show why. Uh, we have to figure out what happens when I apply this function on your population over and over and over again, right? We care about time scales like 82 million years. We want to figure out f of 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 x, right? We care about what this function does over long periods of time. So it would probably be valuable to have a good way of graphing things like this, right? Of showing where where your population goes in on on this time scale and. Physicians have realized this, and they developed this thing called cobweb diagrams. Um, I'm gonna s s try to slowly walk you through this, but tell me if, I, if I'm going too fast. Um, you start at a population x naught, or let's say naught. We're using these, right? That falls here on the population line, right? And then, if I want to find what the population is the next year, I go up to this function and say, oh, hey, I'm going to have this many birds next year. This many more birds or that many birds? That many birds. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to say, OK, that's this many birds. Uh, let's, let's call this P1, right? And then I'm going to put this P1 down on the x-axis, right? Because this is our new 
sometimes, you know, I'm going to say, okay, our new population just increased. It went up to here. This is P1. Right? And then I want to go up to the x axis again, uh, and then over again, and say, okay, this is P2. Is everyone okay with this? This is just finding what a function is. This is the line um, p of t equals p of t plus 1, uh, y equals x. This is the diagonal line. Um, and it helps us a lot in cobweb diagrams because you can do the following. Instead of going over to the y-axis to figure out where this point is, and then going down here, and then going up here, what we can say is, oh, okay, since this point 0.1 now equals the point 0.1 down here, we pull a little y equals x thing and say, oh, let's go this way, over here, and then down. You arrive at the same point. Um, is everyone okay with this? Oh. Is it cool? So we went over to the line p of t equals p of t plus 1, and then we went down to our f of t. Now if we want to figure out the next year, we again go over to this line and up to this function. Right? And here that's equivalent to going taking P2 down here and moving up to the function. Right? So what we have is we start to draw these diagrams is we go over and down and over and down and over and down and, over and down. Cool, crazy things start happening, right? And you can see why they're called cobweb diagrams because they kind of look like a cobweb. After you draw on iterations of them, it's pretty cool, right? So, this seems like something that's programmable, right? So instead of drawing those diagrams that look kind of sketchy over there, we can draw them on the computer. Um, wait, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm totally not there yet. Okay. We, we should probably look first at what happens in a line. Um, and what, what happens in a line is going to give us some instinct as to what a stable node constitutes here, what an unstable node looks like, what a you know, stable spiral, unstable spiral. These terms should sound familiar. <laughs> we're we're going to see what that looks like in this space instead of the other space. Uh, so if I have a function, a linear function, I'm going I'm to draw four of these eventually. But if I have my diagonal line that goes here, and I have a function that looks like this, what is going to happen to my dynamics? Anyone want to guess? Yes. Go for it. It's going to converge on the, on the intersection. Yeah, that's exactly what it's going to do. I go up to this point, I go over here, I go down, I go over. I end up exactly there after you know an infinite amount of time. And it doesn't matter where I start, right? I'm always going to Oh wait no, I went I went I went backwards. I totally went backwards in time there. I want to go <laughs> up to the function over here. Up to the function over here. I'm going to eventually converge at this point. No matter where I start on the number line, I'm always going to collapse into this point. Right? Um, now, what happens if I have a function that looks like this? Same deal, yeah? Not exactly. Because right now, the slope of this line is called 0.5. Uh, call this one minus 0.5. Is this one? Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go through it. This is a stable node. This one was a stable spiral, by the way. Stable spiral. This one, you start here, and I go over to the line. I'm going to end up here, right? And I'm going to end up here, 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 here. And I'm going to converge this point, right? If I start here, I'm going to make sure I do this right this time. Converge on this point. No matter what my say population is to start, it's always going to end up here as time approaches infinity. Okay. So we'll call this a stable node. 
now time for unstable things. What if my slope uh, goes like, I should really be drawing the function in a different color to make this clear. Um, what if my function goes like that? It, it has a really high slope and cuts up to the diagonal line. You might expect that it, that it does something similar to what this one did, uh, but actually what happens is when you, when you go up to the function, and then go over to the line, and then go up to the function and over to the line, you end up kind of spiraling out. And if I do something similar down here, I'm going to end up spiraling out into a negative infinity. I'm going to go away from that. This is a slope that is greater than 1. Um, and th what this is equivalent to is, is taking something and then like raising it to a power of itself and raising it to a power of itself. This, this linear function is just like x times a constant times a constant times a constant times a constant times a constant. Times a constant. That's what it's equivalent to, which is why these 0.5 and negative 0.5 slopes converge in. And this, call it a slope of 3, say, uh, this is going to converge out. Your distance from this point is going to exponentiate outward. It's actually going to be an exponential of an exponential, which is really fast. And then we also have unstable spirals, which happen when our function cuts down really steeply. This is equivalent to multiplying a number by negative 3. Um, and what happens is, you go here, 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 you spiral outward into infinity. Which makes sense. If I'm multiplying a number by negative 3, I, I, I go really high and really low, really high and really low, and, and so on and so forth until yeah. I get my flash and die, something like that. So that's what happens when your function <coughs> Okay. So what if your function is something like this, something more complicated, say a parabola. Say your function is, actually let's, let's write it explicitly, your population times some, some carrying capacity. What do we want to call carrying capacity? C minus P times some sort of birth rate. B. Um, Basically, the function, this is kind of like an x times 1 minus x thing. Um, the way I, I wrote it on the computer is r times x times 1 minus x. This carrying capacity is a constant. Um, all I would have to do to say this is 1 is divide everything by the carrying capacity, and I have an equivalent function. Right? So I really arbitrarily assign this function, and I'm going to, to explain later why I arbitrarily assigned this, and the reason is because it really doesn't matter what this function is, and it's because of a cool thing called universality, uh, but I think I'll get back to that, because we have some cool program things to show. Um, what about why? Okay, so when I have... Wait, can I ask you a question? Uh, absolutely. Um, in the graph of continuous time there was a function of the change in population and uh -huh. you said the carrying capacity was when that function hit zero, right? Because the population wasn't uh -huh. changing. But here, the carrying capacity, were you defining that as when the population goes to zero? You're, you're right. I used uh, two different definitions of carrying capacity. One was where the population stops growing and one was where there's so much population that they all die. Yeah. Um, the the, the only answer I have to why I was able to change the function like that is it would look like the same thing pretty much when you subtract the line, right? Uh, when you subtract the, the current population. And because they look similar, they act similar. <laughs> and this is a cool thing about chaos. When, when things look alike, they totally act alike. So now, I'm going to show this. I'm going to actually expand this. Um, so what we have, uh, I'm, I'm going to explain what I'm going. This, this A is the birth rate. Uh, I, I called it the birth rate before, but it's not called the birth rate now. But it's totally the birth rate. It's something where you multiply by a function and it, it grows. It gets bigger. Uh, right? And so it's the equivalent of taking uh, this hump function and, and, and increasing the, the value it looks like. You can see when, when we slide it, when we slide it along, 
what is changing is that, right? So, well, we can see the dynamics of this function currently when I have a from from a very low point. Um, well, what happens when the birth rate is incredibly low? When it's less than one? This is when your population remaining is uh, less than one times what it currently was. Um, everybody dies. Everybody dies. Yeah. So th this is saying when I when I have a population and I put it into this function, it's always less than the current population. You can see the the function is always less than a line of the current population. So everybody always dies. And you can see this by things spiraling downward, no matter what your current population is. Yeah, isn't that cool? All right, so now, once you increase it to, a, to a, a, a normal kind of function, you have something that happens, which is we've created a stable node. If you look, if you sort of zoom in on the place where they intersect, it looks a lot like what we've drawn for our stable node. Uh, position there. We, we have uh, basically our function is going in no matter where it is to this point. And that point is always going to be reached no matter what my initial population is after a certain amount of time. And you can see the time series. This is graphing what my population is over 300 steps. Alright, is everyone okay with what they see? Awesome. Now, we're going to have something else happen as we increase to a number like 2.9. <laughs> what we get is a stable spiral, right? And around that intersection, we have something crossing over that looks kind of like uh, what we draw through for our stable spiral. And no matter where we start, we're always going to end up there, right? And if you look at the time series, you can see that I start here. I go big, small, big, small, big, small, big, small, but I always eventually approach this. And when we look here, we go big, small, big, small, big, small, but we still approach that point, that stable population, right? Now what happens when we increase the birth rate so that it becomes an unstable spiral in there, right? We know unstable spirals kind of go outward to infinity, but we also know that this function never gets greater than one right now. Right? So you, you can't possibly go to a point where everything would die uh, right now. Which means that we can't, we can't have you know, things spiraling out to infinity when our function is so contained in this one by one box. There's no uh, values that you map to where you would ever leave that box because the function is contained within that box. Um, so what's going to happen when we increase over 3? We have, we have this, this node here, which, which is an unstable spiral. Right? We can see it spiraling out from there. But then it stops spiraling out and eventually ends up in this two cycle. Right? You, you can see it's going outward and outward and outward and outward, but eventually reaches this other behavior where it's going back and forth between two points. Right? And you can see that on the cobweb diagram. It's just bouncing back and forth. And it, it makes a square. And no matter where you are, you always, always end up in that square. Right? Um, I'm going to pull up uh, another thing so we can see like where that square is coming from. Uh, it's look at this. We, we want to when actually I best describe this. When we want to know the population two years from now, when we apply the function twice, uh, what we are interested in is f squared x. Right? So when I, when I apply this function to itself, we want to know what happens. Um, and so what f squared of x looks like in this case is this little thumb. We, and this, what this is graphing is where I am two years later, uh, this, this, this second line. Uh, and so basically, when I have a low population, right, I'm going to end up here and then go to the top. Right? Uh, this, this population corresponds with this peak. This is where, when I'm going to end up at the top, I'm there. And when I'm here, I'm going to end up after two years at the top. Right? When I start going to the top, I'm going to end up after two years around there. Right? So it kind of makes sense that this function goes up and then dips. And then it goes up and then goes down and crashes back down. Uh, so this is what f squared looks like. Um, 
So in order to see when a two cycle happens, well, that's when f squared goes back to itself, right? When I have a population, and then after two years, I have my population again. So what we're interested in is what f squared does. And so you can see when, when we have low populations, we don't really care what f squared does. Eventually, though, this, the, the slope of that line there is going to become greater than negative, or less than negative one, right? We're going to have something like an unstable spiral up here. And you can see that at that exact moment, this f squared function is going to sort of become parallel to the diagonal line, and then two intersections will appear that weren't there before, right? And what those two intersections correspond to is a two cycle. Uh, the slope of the line here, you can see, is less than one, right? The slope of the line here is also less than one, right? This, this is a very stable spiral right now. Um, this right here, of course, the slope is greater than negative one, so it's never going to stay there for a continuous period of time. So when our f of x has a slope greater than one, our f squared of x is going to have this expanding out two cycle. And we saw that over here uh, in, a, in a very similar way. The, the point you're looking for is when a equals three, we have a stable spiral, stable spiral, stable spiral, and then suddenly an unstable spiral. And I'm going to zoom out into the two cycle. And that two cycle is going to get bigger and bigger. So when I have something like 3.04, the two cycle is already out to there and it's never going to stay at that fixed point. It's always going to leave it and enter the two cycle. Is everyone okay with that? Awesome. I wasn't expecting so much acceptance of these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we live in an accepting environment. Oh. Well, it is after midnight. <laughs> Let's see, what, uh, where did our other guy go? Um, so we have, we have this, but what happens when we increase our birth rate even more? And we have the two cycle suddenly become unstable. The slopes of the two cycle are greater than negative one. Now we have an unstable fixed point. We have an unstable two cycle. Where is our function going to go? Well, luckily, f to the fourth is there to save the day. <laughs> okay, f to the fourth is, is kind of the same thing going on as f squared, where it kind of has these, has these little wiggles in it. But those wiggles uh, are going to be, let's see, so they, they, they start off not being appearing, and then suddenly they appear. And well, it's, it's pretty cool. But basically, once, when the, you're going to see exactly what happens going from the one to the two cycle. What you're going to see is going from the two to the four cycle, you have, uh, you have, it's kind of small, but this slope equals negative one, and then the four cycle is going to come through and have a splitting off, a bifurcation, if you will. These, these, these points from the two cycle are suddenly going to split themselves into two, and you're going to have two points kind of close to here, and you're going to have two points kind of close to there. And so in this, I don't actually remember what the exact point is of a four cycle merges, so let's, let's figure out, let's look, and... Okay, that looks like a four cycle. Yeah. So no matter where we are, we're going to end up in this four cycle. Right? And it looks like that. And everywhere we are, you can, you can look on the time series, it really doesn't matter at all. You're going to end up with the exact same behavior over a long period of time. You're going to end up in this four cycle. And as you can imagine, going from a two cycle to a four cycle is going to be the exact same as going from a four cycle to an eight cycle which is going to be the exact same as going from an A cycle to a 16 cycle, and then to a 32 cycle, and then to a 64 cycle, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. But what we can say is that these things are going to happen faster, and faster, and faster, and faster. Is everyone okay with me erasing these things? So, what we had initially was something like this, growing and something like this coming out of it. And that looked exactly the same as you. <laughs> that looked exactly the same as when the f to the fourth function came through like this and then went down. Right? We have the same thing here as we have here. From the two cycles to the four cycles is the same, or from the one cycle to the two cycle is the same as the two cycles to the four cycle. 
but it's happening a lot smaller, isn't it? Right? So that means when I increase the birth rate by a little bit, it's going to take a little bit less for me to kind of push this behavior up. Uh, and so, and then it's going to take a little bit less for me to push it up to the A cycle. It's going to take a little bit less for me to push it up to the 16 cycle. And actually, these are going to happen at a, at a fairly constant ratio because what we're looking at here, uh, it's a poorly, poorly, poorly drawn, but what we're looking at here is kind of a fractal. Yep, that just happened. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because what we have here is exactly the same as what's happening here, only this one is, is smaller by a certain ratio. And then what we have to the next one is a little bit smaller by a certain ratio. And then the next one is a little bit smaller by a certain ratio. And so this goes down and down and down and down and down. And the ratio that we have is Feigenbaum's bounds number. This Feigenbaum's bounds number is pretty damn useful. I believe the ratio is like four point, does anyone know? Zero nine nine. I trust Kyle. <laughs> it's about four, right? So this means when I increase the birth rate by a fourth of what I increased it the last time, and then by a fourth of what I increased it the last time, I'm going to get these new behaviors. But eventually, I'm going to have increased the birth rate as much as I can increase the birth rate because since because every time I'm saying, "Here we go," it's all one over one plus one over four point zero nine nine plus 1 over 4.099 squared. When, if, I'm, if I'm trying to see how much I've completely increased the birth rate in order to get to a 16 cycle or a 32 cycle or whatever, this is going to approach some number. This is going to approach like 3.7. This, this specific series doesn't, doesn't approach that, but uh, it, it approaches it in the same way that this series does. Uh, so when, when I increase past a certain point, Gonna, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to geometrically approach that way. So once I'm done with my 64 cycles and my 128 cycles and my 256 cycles, I reach this point where no cycles of the function are stable. Right? Every every single one, f, f, to the f squared, f to the fourth, f to the eighth, all of these have become unstable. And so what am I going to do? Like there's there's no stable thing that it approaches as time approaches infinity. And this is this is pretty damn scary because we're, we're going to see maybe an 8 cycle come up and I get the 8 cycle, that looks like a 4 cycle. Oh, by the way, this is a 4A transform of the whole thing. <laughs> you can see because uh, the frequency of 0.25 is up, we have a 4 cycle right now. Maybe if we increase it, oh, I believe I, oh man, Mathematica is so cool, oh shit. <laughs> we're not going to do that yet. <laughs> 4 point. Oh look, we have we have some eight cycles popping, um, and this means that it's oscillating between eight different values. There it is. So I go from that, 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 that. Eventually, after eight points, I come back to myself, and no matter where I start, obviously I end up in that eight cycle. But then we reach a point where none of the cycles are stable, and this is crazy. This is absolutely insane because we the population dynamics have now stopped converging, right? We've stopped going from you know, high to low populations. We've stopped going from high to sort of low to kind of low. To, 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 we've stopped having four cycles in population. We've stopped having eight cycles. We suddenly have chaos. And this is what chaos looks like. There's no way of predicting what goes from one year to the next unless you know what the previous year is. We have no way of, of saying what it's going to approach as time approaches, say, 82 million. That sounds like a convenient number, and if you look at the Fourier transform, it's just as ugly. <laughs> um, what am I going to talk about next? I should look at the PowerPoint. So we have dynamical systems. Oh, yeah, I I kind of I kind of skipped over that one. But we're we're applying we're applying f of 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 x and and you kind of this this thing just starts you see it everywhere f of f of x we we're making dynamical systems it's it's applicable in so many different contexts 
But now what we have is universality, because when we're dealing with f of f of f of f of f of x, again, are we okay erasing things? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Apparently the erasers are not okay. So when I have something like f of f of f of x, that's on that. Ignore the fact that my parentheses are imbalanced. We have f of f of f of f of x. Now, regardless of what my function f of x is, I can say this equals Something here. Let's say there. Let's say there exists a function h of x, which equals g inverse of f of g of x. Does everyone kind of get what this means? We made a function g inverse that we stuck inside of f and we stuck outside of x in its normal and inverse forms and we got back some h of x. Okay. And what is g? g is n. Okay. Whatever we want. It's some way of getting back h from f. If we want to move from a system that revolves around f and we want to change it to a system that revolves around h, all we have to do is, is, is stick these things in there. If there's a way of doing that then we can do that, right? <laughs> That's a little side logical. I think so. But, right? No, I'm not sure I buy that last statement, though. But if there's a way of doing it, then we can do it. Then you, well, it's, it's a little iffy. I mean, if you can do it, then you can do it. If. If. Right, if and only, actually. OK, so but what, what happens if I want to find h of 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 h so all I have to do is take g inverse of f of g of g inverse of f of g, etc., 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 of g inverse of f of g of x. Again, my parentheses are totally imbalanced, but there's a lot of them out there, right? <laughs> so I just did this really big, complicated thing. But there, there's a reason I did this big, complicated thing. It's because G of G inverse of anything, you've just done the same operation and the operation backwards. This goes away. This goes away. This, this last G stays, and this first G stays. But if I'm finding F of F of F of F of F of X, and I want to find H of 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 X, all I have to do is multiply by G at the beginning, or put it in G at the beginning and put it in G inverse at the end, and then I have the same sort of behavior going on. So this means if my f of x is something that looks like this, and my h of x, I've suddenly changed to something that looks like this, right? Something that's more similar to what a population dynamics curve is, right? If I can find a function g, that gets me from f to h, my dynamics are exactly the same. Everything we just did there completely applies. Because when I want to increase h, by increase the coefficient on this, on this h function by a little bit, all I have to do is figure out what happens when I increase it by my f function, and then stick it in the g and stick it in the g inverse. This means that certain things start looking similar. This means that no matter what this function is, when I increase it, I'm going to go from a stable node to a 2 cycle, to a 4 cycle, to an 8 cycle, to a 16 cycle, and I'm going to get chaos out of it. Right? This means that everything we did with this function applies to absolutely every single function you can think of as long as you can do this little fancy thing. It's hard to tell whether you can do that fancy thing or not sometimes, but once you can, you know absolutely everything you need to. So, what does this mean? What does this mean? This means that we can map this function to another special little function that looks like this. 
a triangle, right? And when when I have when I have this function exactly equaling one, it maps directly to the function where this equals one. And so we have a triangle function, and we're totally going to do some things on the triangle function. Uh, what I have to do to map this is some fancy trigonometric thing, which I forget, but you can totally look up in about 15 seconds if you wanted to. But I'm going to say that the, dynam the dynamics in a chaotic period of this is equivalent to the dynamics in the period of, of, of this function. Is anyone confused by that? Please say you're confused if you're confused because I'm getting a lot of blank stares. Yes, yes, we're good. Oh my gosh, we're actually good. So all I have to do is figure out what goes on in this function, and then I know what goes on in chaos everywhere, right? This triangle function is going to tell me what chaos means.
only not shown as explicitly. Right? Right. So Every so time. Are we, are we actually good with that? No? Okay. When I, when I have a binary string of numbers and I multiply them by 2, I shift everything over here. Right? When I subtract them from 2, I basically flip every digit. And this is, this is because when I, when I subtract it, I can, I can say 2 equals 1.1111111. And when I subtract anything from 2, I'm basically just flipping all the digits, right? When I take 1 minus 0, I get a 1. When I take a 1 minus 1, I get a 0. OK. So what we're seeing is every single time, because we're doubling this function, we're, the digits are shifting over. And the digits shifting over is a problem. In this case, since this is a 1, we're going to flip everything. Um, we're going to get the 1 again, and we're going to keep flipping everything but we're going to run out of information right about here. We had, we had knowledge of this to, what is that, six decimal places? And then after going through this function three times, we have knowledge of it to absolutely no decimal places. We don't know which half of this is going to be on. So why is that important? Well. It means that when you take something and you put it through a system, if you don't know exactly what it is to start, you don't know what's going to happen to it over time. Right? You would have to have an infinite number of digits of precision in order to know what it ends up like over time. This means when I put a number into this function over and over and over and over again, I'm not going to know what's going to come out. This means that if I have two numbers that I put in the function that are accurate up to 100 digits, they're exactly identical. I put them both through the function, they can end up on completely opposite sides from each other. Right? I also said that what's happening here is exactly what's happening over there. Right? Which means that the population dynamics of the Kakapo, it's actually too relevant to the Kakapo, but it means that once you start somewhere, you have no idea where you're going to end up. There is no stability in your population. You're going to go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, and there's no way of predicting where you're going to end up. Now, so basically, you have to know how it started at the Big Bang before you can know where it's going to end up. Accurate to the most accurate you can. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's exactly what you would need to know. This is why the weather prediction always sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, this is exactly why weather prediction. Always sucks actually because when we have a chaotic system, yeah, which the weather is, yeah, we have the exact same thing going on. If the weather is even the slightest bit different, when we put it through this dynamic system, which is the weather, right? We say, oh, the weather is this at this time, therefore it's going to be this at the next time. We can say that pretty accurately. But if our measurements of what the what the weather is at this time aren't accurate enough, we have absolutely no idea what the weather is going to be doing after a certain amount of time, right? This means that if we have two weather states, which are almost identical, which are very, 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 very slightly apart, one of them could end up causing a hurricane sometime later, and one of them could end up without a hurricane, right? That is the butterfly effect. We have a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere in Cuba, right? That changes the weather state a very, very, very tiny bit. Right? That very, very tiny bit, compounded over time, you end up in a completely different weather state, which is totally unrecognizable from the other one. We have a hurricane going on where we didn't have a hurricane going on before. This means that this butterfly caused a hurricane, which is, you know, a pretty cool thing. I, th I have no, oh, oh yeah, this, this, is, this is what I just did. The slides aren't really relevant to where I ended up going in the lecture, <laughs> but yeah, this is, I, I proved that it. Oh, oh no, I didn't even do this yet. Oh my gosh, I should do this. Check a bunch of functions. I should check a bunch of functions. I'm only going to check one function because it's already 1:15, and I'm really sorry for taking you this long. But I'm going to. All right, so this this is my say a num. This number sign is my variable. Uh, I I did a times x times one minus x, right? What if I did 
instead is, oh wait, no, I'm not going to do that here. I'm not going to do that in this function because that would be bad. I'm going to show you this. This is logistic. I should explain the logistic part. This is what happens to your function uh, when r equals this, 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 this. this. Well, we started with the stable node. Yes, these are bifurcations. <laughs> we started with the stable node, we increased the birth rate a little bit. It split off, it became a two cycle, right? This is, this is, what this function is doing is just taking my dynamical system and applying it a bunch of times and then plotting a bunch of points right where it is. So when it's stable, it makes a line. When it's a stable two cycle, it makes you know, two points. And then those two points make, make two lines. So we, we started with, with this. We split off. We got a stable two cycle. They split off again. They got a stable four cycle. They split off again. They got a stable eight cycle. Remember what I was saying about it being a fractal? If Mathematica is going to zoom in, Oh, it told, oh, that's so nice of you. Look at this, look at this, we're zooming in, we're zooming in. We go from two cycles to four cycles to eight cycles to 16 cycles to 64 cycles. And we're zooming all the way in on this. Eventually we're gonna reach a point where it just looks like crap because my function isn't robust <laughs> enough. But, what are the large gaps? Oh, oh, oh that's a good question. That's, that's an excellent question. I don't entirely know what the large gaps are. I'm probably not the person to ask about that, but, what happens in large gaps is that suddenly, out of chaos, f to the 17th will do something weird, and it will create stability. I don't know exactly why that happens, um, but basically what happens is, is the 17, f to the 17 suddenly you know, creates all these points here, and then they bifurcate, they bifurcate, they bifurcate, and we get exactly what happened previously. Um, this is where it starts to look crappy. <laughs> um, if we zoom out to here, uh, we can see that what happened out here on a big scale is happening in each of these on a small scale. And so each of the 17 points that f to the 17 goes to bifurcate themselves, bifurcate themselves, bifurcate themselves. They bifurcate themselves with finding bounds ratio, actually. Because of the whole universality thing that I showed you, finding bounds ratio applies to like all the functions. Right? And so uh, since it applies to all the functions, let's, let's try it with all the functions but really just sum of the functions. All right, so we have number times r times one minus number. That's the function we were using all the way through this, right? If instead of that, we want to say, uh, how about r times the sine of the number uh, over two times pi? No, over pi. If I take the sine of pi x, that looks like this, right? Zero, one. It looks something like that. It goes up and up, back down again. There is one of those g of x things that maps this to that. And because of that, remember the picture that we saw here? Um, I'm going to change my minimums and maximums a little bit, only because Oh, okay, so I, I, I kind of want to go for it. Sorry, I'm changing my code in front of people, and, and this really shouldn't happen. But I'm, I, when you increase the sine of x, uh, it stays in the one by one box that we described earlier when it goes from 0 to 1. Meaning, if I just have sine of x, it reaches 1 right at its peak. And so I, when I increase that function, I want to go from I'm not making sense. I, I feel like I'm not making any sense. But yeah, for sine of x, we're going from 0 to 1. For x times 1 minus x, we have to go from 0 to 4 to observe all the behaviors. Um, but I've actually never tried this, so... Hmm, that appears to have not worked. Oh, maybe because r sine isn't a thing. Maybe r times sine. I really hope this works. I really, really hope this works. This would be so cool if this worked. It's going to load for a while, but what we're going to see, if everything goes right, is a picture that looks exactly the same as the previous picture. Because of universality. 
we did the exact same thing mapping with a completely different function. We're taking the sign of something instead of like multiplying it by one minus itself. And yet the dynamics observed are exactly the same because of universality. And th this, is, this is me being paranoid parrot and, and checking it with every function. Currently, Mathematica wants to be too slow to check these right now. I don't know whether maybe signs take longer than multiplying by itself. It probably does. Yeah, that, that would make a whole lot of sense. But maybe we'll come back to Mathematica and it'll be nice to us. Otherwise, I'll like submit a picture to the group later of it actually happening. <laughs> And it'll look exactly like a picture we already saw. Yeah. <laughs> Man, maybe I'll like compare them next to each other. Just, just for reference. Uh, oh, another another function that you can that you can map this like sign of x is what if I instead of saying r times x times one minus x, what if I said r plus x squared? That's another function that's mappable to that. If I say, you know. Plus x squared. And over And over I said. Actually, no. Okay. Now it's going to be What What function is not mathable? Um, anything that doesn't look like a hump is probably not mathable. Um, obviously, linear systems aren't mathable to so that. Linear systems never experience chaos. Um, I'll, uh, yeah. Basically, the type topology has to be kind of similar, and I don't know enough about topology to tell you uh, why this is. But if if, if it's if it's hump-like, it'll probably be mappable to this function. And I might actually be done. I don't know if I have anything more. Oh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. We pretty much talked about that. Yeah, that was that was the butterfly effect. That was that was saying that one thing changes another thing, which changes another thing, which changes another thing, and suddenly we have a situation that's completely different from what we had before. Uh, and then we have, we have turbulence, which we're totally not going to have time to talk about. Okay. I was going to talk about Lorentz attractors and all sorts of cool things, but I've already taken up an hour and 20 minutes of your time. And so I'm just going to say thank you.